Welcome to the practical conduct of anesthesia for electroconvulsive therapy. This is a procedure as opposed to an operation. So electroconvulsive therapy is usually performed outside the operating room. It utilizes an electrical shock of very specific waveform, duration, intensity and energy level applied extremely briefly to a patient's head. This is done to induce a seizure and to do this we require an electrical generator, an ECT machine as shown. The shock is applied through electrodes placed on either side of the patient's head and an EEG is simultaneously recorded. The delivery electrodes can be a pair of manually applied paddles, as shown here, or they may be a set of flat metal plates held in place by a tight rubber strap on either side of the patient's temples. Anesthesiologists are used to the head of the patient being their territory, and in ECT we must share this territory with the psychiatrists. During our procedures, such as opening the airway and mask ventilation, we must work around the headgear used to deliver the electrical stimulus. So you must be familiar with this equipment. And before a seizure is delivered to these patients, a bite block must be inserted into the patient's mouth. In any presentation such as this, any presenter is tempted to include as many additional relevant subjects as the anesthesia pro uh, provider may encounter. So in a lecture on ECT, <clears throat> I may want to include related subjects like the addition of ketamine, hyperventilation, the role of caffeine, and perhaps the isolated arm technique. This does desire to be inclusive does present the risk of the basic principles of ECT being lost in a morass of details. And so I will start with the absolute fundamentals and the relevant but peripheral subjects are covered a little later. So let's just cover the essentials as follows. Perform all the preparation and safety checks required for any induction of anesthesia. Commence an IV if not already done. Preoxygenate the patient for a good three to six minutes, proportion to the patient's risk for arterial desaturation. General anesthesia is induced to provide lack of awareness for the electrical stimulus. And methohexatel or propofol are popular choices as induction agent. After induction, confirm ventilatability. Place an oral airway if necessary. Perform modest hyperventilation. Administer a small dose of succinylcholine to modify the ensuing seizure, preventing musculoskeletal damage. Insert a bite block. Have a uh, an assistant remove the patient's socks to observe the plantar response to the seizure. Ensure the patient's limbs are safe should they flail around during the seizure. Inform the psychiatrist that the patient is now ready for the treatment. The shock is delivered. Nobody touches the patient during the seizure and after the seizure subsides on the EEG, only then may you make contact to support ventilation. Now there will be a transitional phase where manual ventilation is gradually withdrawn in parallel with the patient's gradually increasing efforts at spontaneous ventilation. As the patient establishes adequate spontaneous ventilation and opens their eyes, if their vitals are all stable, you transfer them to the recovery room. But you only do, do this when it is absolutely safe to do so. Now let's talk about these steps in a little more detail. Let's go back to the beginning. With a patient lying supine on the stretcher, with a head slightly elevated, with all the appropriate non-invasive ASA physiological monitors applied, our baseline vitals have been documented and a functioning peripheral IV line is established. The psychiatry team can now go ahead and apply the headgear for the delivery of ECT. If the patient requires an adjuvant to augment seizures such as caffeine, sodium benzoate, 
500 milligrams to up to 2 grams IV, this is the time for its administration by either a slow, cautious IV push, or it can be given by infusion over 10 to 20 minutes. Occasionally, caffeine and citrate may be substituted. Next, perform a thorough pre-oxygenation, and because there will be a very prolonged period of apnea during and after the seizure, effective pre-oxygenation is essential, so I recommend 100% oxygen at 6 litres of flow for at least 6 minutes, and longer if the patient is obese or febrile. Take great care with the pre-oxygenation so as not to accidentally disturb or displace the ECT headgear, as precise positioning of these metal plates is absolutely essential. Now, if you are working alone, you need to actually recruit the help of a colleague in the room to hold the manual resuscitator snugly on the patient's face for a thorough and effective pre-oxygenation while you administer the medications. Some psychiatrists request the administration of 50 milligrams of ketamine IV at induction for its reported effect of decreasing the incidence of recurrent major depression for prolonged periods after the treatment. Perhaps even there is a report of up to two years. But further confirmation of this effect is definitely required. If ketamine is requested, it's my practice to reduce the induction dose of intravenous agents such as propofol and methohexethal by 30 to 50 percent approximately. Administer the smallest effective dose of your chosen induction agent, such as methohexetal 1 mg per kilo. Observe the patient closely for the onset of hypnosis. When using methohexetal, do not be surprised by the occurrence of myoclonus in peripheral muscles. When the patient loses their lash reflex and they are unresponsive, we can now move to the next phase of this procedure. If use of the isolated arm technique is routine, this is the time to inflate the tourniquet before the muscle relaxant is given, which will be succinylcholine 1 mg per kilogram IV. And this is administered to modify the electrical seizure, and as it is often a small volume, it is flushed in with 5 ml of normal saline flush. The onset of succinylcholine is heralded by fasciculations, and when these subside, the patient will have a flaccid paralysis. Psychiatrists usually like to observe the resolution of fasciculations in the patient's feet and they also want to witness upgoing plantars and this is a good time to let them know that they can remove the patient's socks if they so desire. The single operator should now return to the head of the bed and if appropriate insert an oral airway and again this should be performed without disturbing any of the ECT headgear. Then, you want to perform brisk hyperventilation for one to two minutes, if appropriate. You're aiming to produce moderate hypocapnia, but of course without insufflation of the stomach, because you know, clearly you have an unprotected airway. So be careful to avoid insufflation of gas into the stomach. When hyperventilation is complete, place the manual resuscitator to one side. Remove the oral airway, replace it with a bite block and check that the patient's head and limbs are safe should they flail around during the seizure. At this point, carefully study the ECG to exclude severe bradycardia before the seizure because this will need treatment before allowing the seizure to be delivered. Return the head of the bed to the horizontal. If all is well, inform the psychiatrist that they may deliver the electrical shock. Ask everyone to stand clear of the stretcher. Now the psychiatry, psychiatry team will simultaneously monitor and record the EEG. And so any physical contact with the patient may distort their EEG reading. So make no contact with the patient if at all possible. The electrical shock is delivered and the patient should now have a grand mal seizure. Now, during this time, you should be focusing on the ECG to ensure rapid resolution of the vagal phase and that if there is any period of asystole that it's brief. Momentarily a sympathetic phase of tachycardia and hy perhaps hypertension will ensue. If the patient requires a beta blocker to prevent a blood pressure surge to, or to reduce tachycardia or even to help decrease the risk of major adverse cardiac events this is the best time to administer it. Followed quickly by a 5 ml flush of normal saline because it's a small volume of solution. And this should be completed without making physical contact with the patient.
because, of course, of the ongoing EEG recording. When the electrical seizure has resolved and the psychiatrist discontinues the EEG recording, you can re-establish contact with the patient. I remove the back block and replace the oral airway, and if the isolated arm technique was employed, then you may now deflate the tourniquet. If the patient's response to the electrical stimulus is suboptimal, or if the seizure is very brief or just absent, the psychiatry team sometimes decide to repeat the stimulus. Now, this is important. You have to be prepared for this eventuality. If a second shock is required and you are concerned about the patient's oxygen saturation, inform the psychiatrist that you will need to re-ventilate your patient. In effect, you're repeating the pre-oxygenation to enable the patient to tolerate prolongation of the apneic period. Of course, occasionally the opposite problem occurs. Interestingly, the induced seizure may be so effective it can persist well beyond 30 to 60 seconds required for efficacy and occasionally you may be asked to deliver a bolus of induction agent to abort what may become an episode of status epilepticus. Now after a satisfactory seizure, the limits of the pre-oxygenation may be reached and oxygen saturations may begin to decrease. So now administer manual ventilations with 100% oxygen. And as the patient recovers from succinylcholine, they will gradually take increasingly stronger and larger breaths. So make an attempt to synchronize your gentle mask ventilations with the patient's spontaneous ventilatory efforts. You're supplementing the tidal volume and hopefully returning the oxygen saturation to the mid 90s, but be careful once again, not to insufflate the stomach. Over the course of the next five minutes, the patient will take increasingly deeper breaths and you will provide proportionally less and less manual support of ventilation. When the patient recovers consciousness and is making good respiratory efforts, you may discontinue 100% oxygen and step down to administer 2 litres of oxygen via nasal cannulae, which delivers approximately 20% oxygen. Prior to leaving the room, it is only polite to ensure that the patient's socks are back on their feet, of course. If the patient has significant cardiovascular or respiratory issues and or the recovery room is distant, then monitor the patient and transfer. But if the patient is otherwise fairly healthy and the recovery room is close, transport monitoring may not be absolutely necessary. So, I hope this presentation has been helpful. It's brief, I know. Adopt those elements you like, omit those you don't like, and create your own unique approach. Remember, in anesthesiology, knowledge is power. And I say this in the hope that it empowers you to provide really excellent quality anesthesia care for your ECT patients. I have two more supplemental videos on this subject, which consider details, or consider the peripheral subjects I referred to at the beginning of the video in much more detail. So please feel free to view them if you want more information about practical conduct of anesthesia for ECT. Thank you so very much for watching my presentation.